In 1869, players in the first football game used a round ball like in soccer. It was tough to carry and awkward to throw, so they changed it to look more like a watermelon. The current shape enables a better grip and passing on an arc that's unique to football. A lot of people handle a football before it ever gets to the field. They start with cowhide. Footballs are traditionally made of this leather because it wears well over time. With a die, a worker cuts out the four sections that make up the ball's skin. A stamping machine then brands the skin with the company logo. They may put other markings elsewhere on the ball, depending on the design of the model they're making. Each of the sections goes into a machine that trims the piece's combined weight down to spec. To strengthen the skin, a seamster sews cotton and vinyl linings onto all four sections. Then she places them in a die that positions them for another set of markings. These four white lines will form two stripes when the sections come together. This is purely aesthetic and varies according to the football model. Now it's time to sew the top sections together and then the bottom ones to each other. Exactly how many stitches this takes is this company's closely guarded secret. This press makes a hole in one of the top sections for the air valve. They make eight holes in the top sections for laces that'll hold the skin tightly around an inflated bag called a bladder. To join the ball's top and bottom sections, the seamstress first cups them and then joins the edges together. She sews the leather inside out to make the stitches less visible. Later, workers will turn the skin right side out by reaching through the opening between the lace holes. This is also where they'll insert the bladder. It's important to flatten the four seams. To do this, a worker places each one on a wheel as a roller passes over the top. This keeps the ball from being bumpy when they stretch the skin over the bladder. A 15-second steam softens the leather and makes it easier to manipulate. A concave press flattens the seams at the tips. This will also keep the ball smooth when they inflate it. Time to turn the skin right side out. A worker places it on a metal bar. Then, reaching through the opening between the lace holes, he grabs the other side of the skin and pulls it through. Then he runs the bar along the inside to reshape the skin. The bladder is made of polyurethane, a type of plastic, with a vinyl patch reinforcing the lacing area. After squeezing the bladder inside the skin, a worker snips off the end of the air valve to keep it out of the way. Then she inflates the bladder a bit to make it rigid enough for lacing. After steadying the ball with clamps, she uses an awl to thread the lace through the holes. Just one vinyl lace measuring four feet. It worms through both sides and then down the center and through all the holes once again. The lacing spaced about a half inch apart wide enough to comfortably grip for that magic pass you've got in mind. Next, workers temporarily overinflate the balls. Steel molds surround them to ensure they'll assume the correct shape. After 90 seconds, the extra air seeps out. Finally, the factory inspects the balls to ensure they're up to standard. Fully inflated, a ball must weigh no more than 15 ounces. It should measure 21 and a half inches through the middle and 28 inches around both ends. After a five-day manufacturing process, these balls are ready for the field. In every sport, fans need to know the score. 
In the early days, scorekeepers climbed ladders to scrawl numbers on a chalkboard. By the time they were done, the score might have changed, and it was time to start again. Modern scoreboards serve up the numbers in an instant. Today's digital scoreboards light up within seconds of a game change, delivering results fast and leaving fans cheering in the stands. They start with the front of the board. A computer program guides a plasma torch to cut out precisely sized slots in a sheet of high-grade steel. The slots will house the illuminated numerals and indicators like arrows. A worker then feeds narrower strips of steel to a press that bends back the edges to create tabs. These strips will serve as the sides of the scoreboard and the tabs will be used to install them. Using a special compressed air tool, a worker clinches the tabs to the back of the scoreboard. This tool punches and stretches the steel to interlock it, joining the parts without using screws, rivets, or welds. He fastens four strips to the back panel. He then attaches the plasma cut front panel to complete the basic structure of the scoreboard. The next worker sprays a powder paint coating onto the entire scoreboard. Then it's into a giant convection oven for about 14 minutes to cure the powder paint. The result is a tough powder paint skin that will make it possible for the scoreboard metal to weather the elements. They're now ready for working parts like LED light studded digit boards, a data transmitter and receiver. He connects the receiver to the power source and installs it inside the cabinet. He pulls the antenna through a hole so it protrudes from the front and he bends it out of the way for now. There are several light studded digit plates on a scoreboard. Each can flash any number. He wires them in a loop, interconnecting them in what's known as a daisy chain configuration. He also plugs in a ribbon style cable to link the digits to the scoreboard's processing module. He inserts the digits in the slots on the front and shields them with a sheet of transparent polycarbonate. He screws a metal framework around each digit assembly to secure it. He confirms that the wiring is good and that all the numbers light up. He connects the wireless computer processing module to the numbers and also wires it to a power source. He mounts the module to a panel that will then be installed through the back of the scoreboard cabinet. An inkjet printer reproduces the company logo on adhesive-backed paper, followed by some fierce-looking team graphics. Later, a weatherproof coating will be applied to the paper graphics. They also use vinyl decals. The worker peels away the unwanted material from around the lettering. This is called weeding. After transferring the decals to applicator tape called the pre-mask, she carefully positions the grouping on the front of the scoreboard. Satisfied that it's in the perfect spot, she tapes it at the top. She then peels off the backing and the letters cling to the pre-mask. Using a squeegee, she presses the decals to the metal board, smoothing any messy looking bubbles or buckles. She removes the tape, then lifts the pre-mask very carefully so as not to lift any of the decals in the process. With all the lettering now in place, the numbers on the board will mean something to the crowds in the stands. They equip the scoreboard with a speaker and horn that will sound off in the event of a touchdown. And no need to run cable from the scoreboard to the keyboard it's operated by remote control. Using that system, a worker now tests all the functions of the scoreboard. This test is thorough and takes about 20 minutes. When it's done, he declares the scoreboard ready for game action. Today's sports scoreboards come in any shape or design the customer desires. When it comes to drumming up a little team spirit, a modern scoreboard can be a game changer. The invention of artificial turf in the 1960s led to a whole new field, 
one that never needs mowing, watering, or weeding. Faux grass was developed by the carpet industry and made possible by technological advances, and the concept has really taken root. Synthetic turf has changed the landscape of professional sports. You see it in stadiums, arenas, and training fields around the world. It all starts with bags of white plastic pellets. This is the base material for the turf. They add green pellets for color, along with chemical stabilizers and additives. Equipment melts and extrudes the plastic through a steel plate with holes in it. This creates strands of green. The strands exit through a trough of water, which cools and solidifies them. Machinery pulls the strands through an enormous comb to keep them separated as they head to the next station. Here, rollers stretch the strands until they become as thin as real grass. The stretching also strengthens them. Spools now roll up the synthetic strands. Once a spool is full, they remove it. Next, they unwind several spools at a time. The strands come together to form a multi-ply synthetic yarn. The yarn travels over guides. This keeps it from slackening as a big spool winds it up. Further down the production line, mesh fabric merges with synthetic sheeting while the multi-ply synthetic yarn travels through tubing to a tufting machine. The tufting machine is a giant sewing machine. It has up to 250 needles. These needles hook the yarn through the mesh synthetic sheeting. They make hundreds of rows of stitches per minute. Underneath, small knives cut the loop yarn, so it looks like spikes of grass. As you can see, this process is a whole lot faster than waiting for grass to grow. An inspector examines the turf to make sure the yarns are even. Then machinery moves it forward to a coating roller. The roller picks up adhesive from a trough below and applies it to the backing of the turf as it moves across. This binds the looped web of artificial grass to the backing. The adhesive is a bit gooey at this point and needs to be dried. The dryer is partly open air and partly enclosed. The enclosed section is about 55 yards long. The temperature is carefully controlled. Too hot and the synthetic grass might melt. As it exits, hot pins burn holes into the turf to make it water permeable. Now they check to make sure this grass looks good on the surface. They pull out loose bits and measure the fibers. Then it's over to a device that simulates the effect of football cleats to confirm this turf is tough. To install artificial turf, they lay a rubber base and add the turf. They distribute sand throughout spikes of grass to give the turf weight. Then they spread rubber granules for a softening effect. But some turf is more carpet-like, no fillers needed. You are more likely to see that in floor hockey arenas. It's time to wrap up this turf job and toss a few balls around. And when it comes to looking like the real thing, artificial turf is definitely in the ballpark. A ring celebrating a special achievement makes a cherished lifelong keepsake.
whether it's a class ring to commemorate graduation from high school or a championship ring for the players on a winning sports team. As the years go by, this special piece of jewelry keeps the memories close at hand. Championship rings are entirely custom made. They typically feature the team name and logo, along with the year of the big win. They can also have personalized touches such as the player's name or jersey number. Class rings, on the other hand, come in several ready-made designs presented in a catalog. Graduates order their favorite style, then personalize their ring by choosing options such as symbols, gemstones, and engraved lettering. For each style, a jewelry designer first sketches the ring's base, the overall shape of the ring minus the decorative elements. Then, an industrial designer transforms the sketch into a three-dimensional computer drawing. The ring's decorative components go through the same process. The jewelry designer's color drawing adapted to 3D software that guides a computer-operated milling machine. The machine transforms two blocks of aluminum into a two-part mold for each of the flat, detailed components of the ring, meaning all the parts except for the base. A steady flow of lubricant washes away the shards of metal the machine cuts away. Bit by bit, the mold assumes very intricate detail of the ring design. Once it's finished, they coat the cavity with a powder that prevents the wax they're about to inject from sticking. Then they load the mold into an injection device. It shoots in hot liquid wax at high pressure, filling all the minute nooks and crannies of the intricately detailed cavity. Seconds later, they extract a wax model of, in this case, the elaborate top of a championship ring. To make a wax model of the ring's base, they use a flexible rubber mold because it would be too difficult to extract the three-dimensional shape from a metal mold. They inject the wax at low pressure, as a rubber mold can't withstand high pressure injection, nor is it necessary when the base has no intricate details. The next step is to assemble the wax models of two of the ring's components, connecting the parts with joining wax applied using a fine tip soldering iron. It's at this stage that they also size the ring for the customer, either cutting out a section of the shank to downsize or adding to the shank to enlarge. Next, they begin building a wax structure on which to mount the wax models for several rings they'll be casting simultaneously. They solder a small stem to each model. Then connect each stem to a large wax rod. When they're done, they have a tree-like structure holding all the wax models. They solder this structure to a rubber base, then slip a metal flask over it. Next, they mix up some plaster, blending it for a good half hour under a vacuum to remove all the air bubbles. Then they inject the plaster into the flask, engulfing the wax models and supporting structure inside. Over the next 12 hours, the plaster hardens into a shell around the wax. Next, 12 hours in a hot oven. This burns out the wax components, leaving behind a cavity in the shell shaped precisely like them. Now it's just a matter of melting down the metal for the final casting. In just minutes, the induction furnace has heated the metal, in this case gold, to the required molten state. 
they carefully pour it into the plaster shell. Gold flows down channels and into cavities left when the wax burnt out. Once the gold cools and solidifies, they submerge the shell in cool water. This instantly dissolves the hot plaster, releasing the cast piece. Everything that was once modeled in wax is now replicated in gold. They cut the ring components off the structure, then remelt the structure to reuse the gold. There's still a remnant of the structure on each ring component, so they grind it off. Next, using a grinding tool so small that it fits through the ring, they smooth the inside surface. Then they stamp in the company name, along with the internationally recognized code identifying the metal, such as 10K for 10 karat gold. To smooth the ring's outer surface, they use a grinding wheel which has splits in its abrasive discs. The split produces a see-through view as the discs spin at high speed. With the entire surface now smooth, the ring is ready for polishing. They apply some polishing compound, then using another split wheel, shine it up. Next, the top of the ring goes to the stone setting department where using a fine rotary tool, a specialist contours each setting to fit the gemstone's pointed base. Then he sets each gemstone, forcing down the four surrounding prongs onto the edge of the stone. Next, he sets tiny diamonds. He presses each one into place, then pushes the surrounding metal inward to hold the stone down. The top of the ring complete, they now solder it to the base. Using an airbrush, they apply a fine mist of black paint, then wipe it off. This leaves behind a black background highlighting the ring's details. Now they apply some polishing compound to a cloth buffing wheel and polish the ring to a high gloss shine. They clean the ring thoroughly in repeated ultrasonic baths. Ultrasound waves traveling through the water dislodge all traces of polishing compound and other residues. A few blasts of pressurized steam and the ring is completely dry. Certain rings also have enamel decoration. Enamel is liquid glass. It goes on like paint, then has to be baked in an oven for 30 minutes. Finally, a computer-guided engraving machine inscribes any name or personal message customers request be written on or inside their rings. The tradition of the class ring dates back to the 1800s. Championship rings, a wearable trophy of sorts, are a more recent custom. Both make a proud and triumphant fashion statement. Football helmets cushion the cranium, helping players score touchdowns without sustaining head injuries. Helmets have been part of the sport for over a century. First made of leather, then padded plastic. They keep the end zone from becoming a danger zone. In a game of tackles and tumbles, a helmet is essential equipment. To make one,
plastic pellets are suctioned into a machine that melts and molds them into a dome shape. This fist-like device shapes the inside of the shell, which hardens in just a matter of seconds. A robot then collects it and transfers it to a conveyor. It's quite a lineup. The shells move into position for a trimming, and the extra plastic from the molding is clipped off. Next, a robot drills up to nine holes in the shell. The holes will be used to attach a liner, face guard, and various pieces of hardware. This robot works far more quickly than a human can, performing all the drilling in just 30 seconds. This is the ultimate in computerized precision. A worker collects the drilled shell and moves a new one into position for the robot. The outside of the helmet shell is roughed up with an orbital sander. This preps it for priming and painting. This factory uses a high-grade brand of automotive paint. And it takes three coats to make sure this paint job is rugged enough to survive a go on the gridiron. The helmets cure in the open air for up to 18 hours. During this time, a chemical reaction hardens the paint to a glossy finish. Not every helmet is painted. Some teams prefer tinted plastic. It all depends on the look the team is going for. Labels are attached, including safety information, trademark logos, and the date of production. This padding is made of vinyl and foam. Workers snap it in place in the crown of the helmet. The padding for the side and back is made of the same material. The back is reinforced with a plastic bumper. A helmet from each production run undergoes an impact test. It's fitted on a head-shaped form equipped with sensors, which are carefully calibrated. The technician presses a button, and the helmeted head falls. This mimics the effect of a player's head hitting the ground during a tackle. The computer then measures the force of the impact on the head. Once the production run gets the OK, the face guard is attached. It's made of plastic-coated steel and has been custom produced at a different factory. There are dozens of face guard styles for the player to choose from. This helmet is now looking pretty fierce, but it's not ready for action yet. It needs a chin strap and cup. This machine uses heat to transfer a foil logo onto the polyester chin straps. It also cuts them to the correct length. Once a chin cup has been sewn to the strap, the assembly is loosely fastened to the helmet. Later, it will be precisely fitted to the player's head. This helmet is now almost ready for kickoff. There's a final inspection, and then they wrap it up, complete with the manual and fitting instructions. It's taken less than a day to manufacture a football helmet that can withstand thousands of blows. Because in the game of football, protection against head injury is a victory in itself. When you blow into a whistle, part of the airstream exits the slot in a swirling motion generating sound. The rest of the airstream travels through the whistle chamber, then exits the slot reinforcing the sound. The little ball whirling inside puts the trill in the whistle blast. Quality whistles are made of solid brass because nothing beats its resonance.
Production begins with a narrow brass sheet not quite four hundredths of an inch thick. A punch press slices through the sheet, cutting a square connected to two circles. The factory calls these pieces the Mickey Mouse ears. One by one, they go into a second press that folds the circles inward to form the sides of the whistle's barrel and bends the edges of the square inward to form the top and sides of the mouthpiece. At the same time, it strikes the mouthpiece against a die that embosses the company logo into the metal. Another brass sheet feeds a third press. This machine punches out and partially shapes the part that forms the rest of the whistle. It notches the tapered end, which will be the underside of the mouthpiece, giving your teeth something to grip. Now a fourth press finishes shaping these pieces. It bends the other end into a circle to form the barrel. The two main parts of the whistle are now ready. A worker snaps them together with pliers. Note that on the bottom piece, the barrel stops short of meeting the top of the mouthpiece. This creates the whistle's air slot. This press cuts and folds a brass sheet into the third and final part of the whistle, called the tip. It's a piece on the back that holds a ring for hanging the whistle. The tips go into a bowl feeder. The vibration orients them in the same direction so that a robotic arm can pick them up and put them in a holder. Tin and silver solder is applied to each tip. This will bond it to the whistle. To fuse all the parts together, solder is applied in six different spots. The solder liquefies as a gas flame heats it to about 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. It flows around all the seams, filling them in a matter of seconds. A blast of cold air solidifies the solder. Even then, it's still steaming as the whistle comes off the machine. The ball that goes inside the barrel is about a half inch in diameter and made of synthetic cork, which doesn't absorb moisture so the ball never gets soggy and stuck. A worker holds each whistle, now plated with nickel, against the insertion machine. The device works like these pliers, squeezing a ball through the whistle's air slot. With one side of the barrel cut away, you can see how the ball regains its shape as soon as it clears the slot. The last step is to hook a steel ring onto each tip. The factory packages its whistles with a nylon cord called a lanyard. A hook on one end attaches to the whistle's ring. 